Please listen carefully. Hey everyone, welcome to the 14th episode of the Study Space Podcast, a show dedicated to helping students like you earn better grades, navigate your college journey, and become lifelong learners. My name is David, content strategist at UniPlan Team, and I'll be your host for today. Today we'll be continuing our series of talks about taking a pre-medical path in college and what it entails. Joining me today is Natalie Tran, who is a pre-medical student currently attending UC Irvine. Natalie, welcome to the podcast, and I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, um, so my name is Natalie. Um, I am a chem major, and I, like you said, I want to be a doctor in the future. Um, maybe, ideally, a cardio. And uh, I don't really have that many hobbies or interests, mostly just reading and writing. And I think that's okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna hit it off with the first question, and this is gonna be one that I'm gonna ask all the pre-medical students, just because I think it's really important, um, especially coming from the lot, uh, one of the last podcasts where Andre said that you know pre-medicine is obviously a very difficult path, um, and it's well known that that medicine is difficult. Um, so what what really inspired you to want to pursue medicine, and what motivates you to keep going? All right, so what inspired me? to be in medicine. Well, you know how sometimes when you drive along the road and you see these dead animals on it, and some people are like are really disgusted by it, but I felt really bad. And that was part of the reason how I wanted to, like that was part of the reason why I wanted to be in medicine. And that's how I knew I wanted to be in medicine because I felt this sort of empathy for it. And I just want to help it get better. And I felt really bad that I couldn't do anything. And secondly, my father is a nurse, which is pretty cool. And I, I really want to be like him because because uh, he gets to help people all the time. And his job is very active and I really want an active job so I don't get bored. I just don't want to sit around all day and just type away on a computer. And that just doesn't sound like the ideal job for me. Okay, sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously like that, that, I think that's counts as like your, you know, your inspiration for pursuing medicine, but obviously after all you've been through, you know, uh, so far, what really motivates you to keep going? I know medicine is difficult as we already mentioned, but like what, what like, um, you know, on, on a daily basis reminds you that you still want to do medicine? Well, for me, um, what really reminds me that I want to be in medicine every day is that I see people sick all the time. I get sick, you get sick, my grandparents get sick, and there's just this innate feeling that I want to take care of them for a living. Like, I don't want them to be sick anymore, <laughs> but I know that's not possible. People are eventually going to die, but I don't want to slow that process down because the ultimate goal of medicine is immortality, right? I want to contribute my part into that goal because you know, living forever means you don't have to lose a loved one. All right, awesome. Um, so you mentioned before the podcast started that many of the study tips that Julian and I provide on the podcast don't necessarily um, work or apply to everyone. And obviously here at UniPlan team, we're really open to listening to other perspectives from college students. So we'd like to hear about what sort of um, study strategies you have adopted and what works for you. Right, so I'm a chem major, but I'm also doing a biology minor because pre-med is very biology intensive. So uh, as part of this plan, I have to take obviously a lot of bio classes, which are pretty bad, no offense to bio majors or anything, but you know, they're pretty hell. But um, so one of my strategies for getting through bio is that I just sit down with a book and I just read through the book. And as I read through the book, I take notes, and that's my first read through. My second read through, I go through again, and I take out pieces of pa uh, a piece of paper, and then I write questions, and then I copy word for word from the book um, the answers to those questions. And I, at the end of the um, at the end of the chapter, I quiz myself on those questions, and I think that really helped me memorize the book. Okay, interesting. And do you think that applies to all pre medical students, or do you think it just works for you personally? Well, for um, I know for my classes here at UCI, memorizing is a big part of biology. I don't know about other um, other schools because I know there are some 
like applications for biology and um, some professors might test you on that. But for me, it was mostly just memorizing. So that really helped me through bio. Interesting. So uh, a little quick aside, I, I know you said that there's a lot of memorization involved with biology and I'm assuming with chemistry too, or, or is it more? Uh, chemistry, there's, it's like kind of half and half. Okay. So some, some stuff, obviously you do have to remember, uh, remember like mercury is liquid at room temperature yeah, 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 for sure. and, and the strong bases and acids. That's, that's the stuff you have to remember, but there are a lot of things you could just understand and apply. Okay in terms of like mathematical equations, um, pretty much a lot of concepts you can just learn. Okay, so obviously with such, um, I guess, memorization base, because I'm an engineer, obviously, um, so like I, I'd say 90% of our curriculum is, is pretty much applying what we know rather than um, memorizing. So we have like a few equations, but obviously we derive a lot of stuff from there and every problem I like to say is different. Um, so. And I know that it's it's really like easy for me to find ways to apply what I learn and, and to make it interesting for me. But I'm just curious, like with a kind of memorization based curriculum, how do you find yourself still engaged in the material? Like what what actually interests you about it? Because from my perspective, obviously it sounds boring, but I want to hear your insight into it. It is boring. <laughs> oh, I just do okay. it because um, I know it'll get me to med school and that the end goal because I really want to be a doctor and that's just what pulls me through bio bio because right now I'm, I was taking a course on ecology god I hate ecology <laughs> it is the worst subject in bio I'm more of a biochem person myself because you know it's chem intensive and I'm a chem major so it interests me but biology is just not for me I hate memorizing hmm okay so yeah, I mean, I know that biology is kind of the common route when it comes to, um, you know, being a pre-medical student. Like, I don't think I've met a lot of people who are actually not like some sort of, of biology or, or public health. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Can you talk about why you think most people go for biology and whether or not you think it's actually the right choice to make? Right. So um, obviously I'm a chem major, so I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> Um, a lot of people go for bio because that's the easier route, obviously, because uh, I've noticed that a lot of bio majors can't do chem, but mm. funny enough, because bio is based on chem. And then, so you have these bio majors who are struggling in gen chem, <laughs> and I'm guessing that's why they don't go to, uh, chem as opposed to, like, as opposed to bio. And another reason is that bio covers a lot of the, uh, pre-med prereqs which is really nice because you get a bio lab um, or sometimes if you're lucky at UCI, you get a bio lab, even if you're a bio major. Cause I know a bunch of students weren't able to graduate cause they couldn't have a, bi didn't get a lab, which is unfortunate. Hmm. And what's your opinion on the public health major? Um, they're the weaker bio majors. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you elaborate on what weaker? So weaker basically means? if you're in, in, um, <clears throat> in public health, right? You're you're taking the same classes as a bio major in your first two years, I think. But after a okay. while, you branch off and do your own um, and do your own public health um, operatives. So you're not doing bio operatives, which are ob obviously harder than public health operatives, especially if you're studying mm. public health policy, which is like a social science of science. So not really a science. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so I guess moving on to another question, um, I know that you're doing research into a field that's called phage therapy. So could you tell us a little bit about what phage therapy is and what it means and what your research entails? All right. So I was in my club, in my club, <clears throat> we do this thing where we write articles on, uh, developing research and developing research fields. And I was assigned the topic of phage therapy. I watched a Kirkazat video on phage therapy before and found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. So basically what it is, is that bacterial infections are becoming resistant to antibiotics. So the purpose of penis, like antibiotic and penicillin is to, you know, kill the bacteria. <laughs> it's because they're called antibiotics, but after a while, some of these bacteria are adapted to this new environment where um, a lot of its uh, species even gets killed off, you know? So they're, now that these new um, uh, evolved bacteria, they're not, 
responding to the antibiotics like they should be. So we're looking for new ways to cure bacterial infection. And one of these ways is through bacteriophages, or as they're common, more commonly known as viruses, like the coronavirus. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you know, um, obviously, some of these viruses, <clears throat> or most of these viruses, aren't harmful to your body because they could be found in your body, especially in your gut, because that's a very, very big microbiome in your body. And we're just using these bacteria, um, this bacteria and virus relationship. Which, fit, which has been existing for decades, or not even decades, millennia, and like we're just utilizing it to kill off bacteria. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so obviously you mentioned that you write for a club, so can you tell us a little bit about <clears throat> what other activities you like to do besides that beta therapy research, like any extracurriculars you do and or side projects perhaps? Um, so I am working on a side project with, you know, with you. Uh -huh. It's called um, Political Think Space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just basically compiling political news and some backgrounds on polit political news to get people more interested in what's happening today in the world and politics at large. Interesting. Sounds like, sounds like a great website. I wonder why. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because I started it. You know? oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So... Um, obviously, we've mainly had Julian and I running these podcasts, and um, as you guys may know, I go to Johns Hopkins University, which is a private research university in the state of Maryland, um, and Julian went to San Jose State University, which is a public land-grant university, um, I believe, in it, literally in San Jose, in the, in the middle of Silicon Valley, um, as he always mentions, and... Um, and obviously, these are two very vastly different university systems, and we've discussed those differences in previous podcasts. Uh, but Natalie, obviously, you go to UC Irvine, which is part of the University of California system. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on the University of California system and, and what type of people, I guess, it's right for, um, what sort of um, opportunities it provides as opposed to the private and the Cal State universities that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so I think... It's it's pretty, it would be fair to say that a UC is kind of in between Cal State and a, um, and a private, <laughs> sorry, okay. I blanked out there for a mm -hmm. sec. So what UCs are, they're research facilities. So you get a lot of research opportunities there if, if you reach out, because if you don't reach out, there's nothing you can do, you know? So... Yeah, so even if as a first year, I was able to get a research position, which is very abnormal if you go to a Cal State, right? So I guess the main difference between Cal States and privates and a UC, uh, and a UC is that a UC is based on quarters. So there are 10 weeks in a quarter, in a quarter, which is way faster than what privates and Cal States are used to, right? You guys get 15 weeks? Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. So that's like, 150 percent more than ours mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's so what we live in is our environment is pretty stressful because you're either coming off you're either preparing to take a test or you're coming off of a test preparing to take another test all right basically yeah, yeah. so i like to imagine it as a conveyor belt you know so you're always being pushed to mm -hmm. tests and you're always pre preparing but the good thing about that is that you have a lot more classes, a lot more things you could take. And if you mess up in a class, like you get a C, you have the capability of kind of restoring your GPA by taking more classes and getting A's in them, which is something I know some people did uh, when they were in UCI, when they were at UCI. Interesting. Yeah, I know the quarter system is something that kind of actually, um, it unattracted me is that even a word like it, it really pushed me away from repelled. yeah repelled me from from uci and just other uc schools mm -hmm. except for berkeley i know berkeley does a semester system but right. um i know it, it really repelled me because i'm kind of a slow learner and i think i like to absorb the material and i really like to actually learn from the classes i don't know mm -hmm. if you feel the same way yeah. um, but i feel like it's a lot harder to retain information in the span of 10 weeks no like what what, what would you say about that you think so I think it's fairly easy. Well, for mm. me, my um, when I study, <clears throat> I don't really like going to lectures. Mm -hmm. 
which is something I know like engineers they're pretty reliant on lectures I'm guessing because um I mean it depends on the class like well, in for example classes like physics or math you can just kind of you know go off the textbook but for a class like I'm taking a class called digital systems fundamentals mm -hmm. this semester um and it's very lab based very project based and mm -hmm. so we do rely on a lot of lectures because he doesn't even go through the slides actually right. <clears throat> he ends up going through just sort of his own memory and so he he just pulls little bits of knowledge out of nowhere and so we have to remember that for the test because it's super important right. um but yeah i mean I, I would say that lectures are quite important for engineers yeah yeah so for me at least in the general education or not general education but general classes general chem classes I could just get by with reading and that's what I've been doing this this last quarter um I've been getting pretty decent marks which I'm really proud of so I just like staying home reading chem, my chem book and my my bio book but obviously you can't do that for labs <laughs> you actually have to be present for labs I love labs. Oh god, because because you're not a chem major. <laughs> yeah, no, my physics. Okay, I actually had a really stressful time in physics one lab last semester, um, which is mechanics. And when I got to electricity, I liked it a lot more. I wonder why. I don't mean I, I could possibly think of why, but yeah. yeah. Imagine running around like a chicken with its head, trying to grab a bunch of chemicals, and and measuring them precisely by the way and doing calculations and taking observations and data all in the span of four hours that's just not pleasant and then writing a full lab report after that's just not pleasant <laughs> mm, yeah it sounds like sounds like a rough time yeah fun huh that's just the life of a chem major yeah so i mean um i guess i, I don't know like 10 weeks is obviously a very short amount of time so do you do you think that you're able i mean obviously you haven't like been to another university but do you think you're able to learn the same amount of content that you are in let's say like a, a semester-based school like hopkins for instance like do you think you guys learn the exact same amount of information because i know you take uh, a lot more classes but i don't know if you actually learn more uh, content wise well i really haven't talked <laughs> to people but i'm pretty sure we do like our gen chem series right now mm -hmm. is it covers the whole year in ap chem so okay, it's just ap chem divided into three <clears throat> three sections basically yeah and our math is pretty it's pretty fast paced i'm guessing mm -hmm. but it's yeah. yeah so our first quarter well it was supposed to be um math 2a which is calc ab and then calc bc in another in the second quarter and then calc Three, I'm guessing for you guys mm -hmm. in the third quarter, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how the calc the calculus system works at your school. Um, it's really interesting because I know at my school, calculus three is regarded as a really hard class, um, whereas at a lot of other schools, for some strange reason, calculus three is actually sort of a transition class. Like people will take calc one and two, you know, in high school, and then they'll go into college and take calc three. And from what I can tell, the calc three at UC San Diego, at least only covers um about half of what my calculus three class covered and the and the second class which is called calc four is what really goes into the meat of my calc three class so i found that really interesting i didn't know because i just looked at the syllabus and i was like oh that's really interesting because um i'm gonna use some like some jargon some terminology here but the first unit of calc three is more like directional derivatives and um, that kind of stuff, like a few double integrals, triple integrals, stuff like that. Um, but then the second unit gets into stuff like Stokes theorem, Green's theorem, a lot of the more fundamental stuff that goes into Calc three. So I don't know. I just found it really interesting how they split it into two classes, whereas one was ours is just one semester. Well, I'm taking Calc three next quarter, so okay. I don't really know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. And um, for us. To my knowledge, this is what I've heard around campus, is that Calc 2B, which is Calc BC equivalent, mm -hmm. is the most failed class at UCI. Okay, interesting. Yeah, which was concerning for me at the start, uh -huh, but uh -huh. I ended up doing pretty well in that class. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Calc 2 is always weird in college. I know my, my school's calculus 2, the average was like a 58% or something, mm -hmm. and it's considered one of the hardest classes and we don't know why because a lot of the people in that class actually took calc bc 
in high school, but they just want to review the calculus content because they're not confident, you know, enough to go into Calc 3 or, okay. or differential equations. Um, but yeah, that's a common trend, I guess. Calc 2 is just hard. I know Julian said that too. Um, I thought it was pretty easy. Oh. Actually, because okay. <laughs> I didn't even do homework in that class. Okay, let, so but, that's interesting. Yeah. How did you manage to get away with that? I'm curious. Um, so it covered a lot of uh, integrals, which we did in, uh, in AP. Okay. And I was pretty good at integrals. So I just sat there, dozed off in my AM lecture, which you should not take if you're a commuter. <laughs> okay. And yeah, it was, it was an easy ride, I thought. Except for the final, which had a lot of series, which I didn't cover in Calc AB. So, you know, I was kind of at a loss, but still managed to snag a B minus, which is not that bad considering I skipped like five classes. Wait, B minus? In, on my final, but I ended up with oh, an A minus. Oh, in the okay. Class. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I was just saying, like, whoa, that's a. I mean, okay, obviously, on the topic of medicine, a GPA. A drop in GPA is like a huge blow to you guys, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. So obviously, if you did get a B minus, I'd be very surprised because <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people would just straight up drop out after that, especially right. in the semester system. But I guess that's a good thing about the quarter system, right? Mm. You guys have a lot more opportunities to redeem yourself. Right. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about that. Like, how how important really is GPA to med school applications, and and why do you think they care so much compared to other stuff? So, med, just to uh, preface this. Med school applications are a three three pro, three step process. So the first, they look at your stats, so your GPA and your MCAT. Then they give you secondaries, which are which are your essays, like your um, PIQs, or your personal insight questions. Yeah, yeah, for the right? UC application. Yeah. yeah, and then third, they give you an interview, and based on those three process, they decide whether to admit you or not. And you could be dropped on in at any step. So if they don't like you, in the first step, you're gone, and you won't get to those two other steps so it's like a pre preliminary kind of round right so the way i'm guessing why they put so much emphasis on stats is that they want to make sure that you can pass med school med school is extremely hard mm. obviously it's i heard it's one of the top education no programs in the world u.s med schools and um, they just want to make sure you can pass it because there are no curves in med school. You either get the raw A or you don't. That's just what it is, you Interesting, know? Interesting, yeah. Yeah, and that's why they want to make sure you could pass that. You could pass the um, MLEs, US MLEs, and you could become a full-fledged doctor. Well, what are the MLEs? Can you... Oh, I think... Uh, or the steps. It was like step one, step two, step three. It I think... tests you on like your knowledge mm. first and then your rounds and then like i think um and then your uh, re residency stuff okay i'm that, pretty sure i'm not too sure though i haven't looked into it that stands for medical licensing exam right or yeah is or that... usmle and then you have steps yeah, yeah. okay it's, yeah it's in three steps interesting yeah okay so you've done your research obviously into hopefully i'm meds. correct <laughs> right yeah so i mean obviously you've done your research so what advice do you have for students uh, right now who are on a pre-med track and looking to apply to medical school like what do you think would help them stand out look better on their med school application and really i guess in the long run help them become a better doctor what do you think um so i heard med schools are doing a more holistic approach in terms of selecting students which means that they're looking not for not only for the numbers but also for the personality i've heard okay this is this is just hearsay but there was this girl at UCI who had a 4.0 GPA. That's that's pretty good, you know. That's impressive, yeah. Yeah, and um, she was a bio major, I'm pretty sure. She came up with this EMT program for pre-med students, so she's pretty she's a pretty accomplished individual. Hmm. Can't get into med school. We I just don't know why, you know. It might be her personality. It might be her MCATs. I'm not too sure, but people are looking for personality now too, which is. Which is fun, you know. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. That you, you you put it like that. I mean, I've always thought that med school is kind of more of an academic process, um, but you you mentioned a lot about holistic yeah. admissions, which is really interesting. So um, to build, I think a good applicant should have uh, three three types of extracurriculars. All three. So one would be personal, mm -hmm. clinical, and then research. Uh, research is pretty self-explanatory. You get in a lab, you do research, right? Or you do clinical research, which is when you go to the hospital, you interact with patients, but it's research. And then 
clinical experience is like uh, volunteering at a hospital or doing shadowing work with a doctor. And then you could also do, and you have a personal uh, extracurricular, which is like my political think space or my club that I'm writing for right now too. Okay, yeah. Those would count. It shows that you have a personality. It shows that you could interact with other people, be a leader, and yeah, and you could interact with patients. Interesting. So you mentioned this little like uh, personality kind of aspect of right. the missions process. So like, would you just suggest that people join, you know, like one activity that they just that's just really unique to them or like how, how do you um, select that? So I would, I would recommend going into an activity that you're passionate about, right? Or club that you're passionate about okay. and trying to get a leadership position in that club because mm. leadership is also very important. So I was, I, I do a lot of, I, not, not a lot, but I do some shadowing at the ICU. And these doctors are such great leaders. They have a team of nurses and they're, they're going through rounds of patients and they're asking for personal information and all of that. They compile everything and they, they help the nurses work together and they, um, they extract information out of the nurses, you know, because every nurse is responsible for each patient and they have like 50 patients at a time. Mm, and they they have to care for those patients. So they talk to the nurses. They're fantastic leaders. They know how to talk to people. They know how to comfort people, comfort family members, which is also very important when you're a doctor. You have to understand how your patients feel. If you don't, then you won't give the best care possible to them. Interesting. Obviously, um, we've talked about this before, but... I haven't had the best experiences with doctors in my life. Um, in freshman year of high school, I tripped while playing uh, flag football and I managed to fracture my elbow. I went to the emergency room and the way they found out that I fractured my elbow was the ER doctor gave me a good old yank Yoink. and I, uh, <laughs> I screamed. So that's how she knew it was right there. Uh, I thought she was actually very rude, but um, how do you suggest that like you know pre-medical students work on their bedside manner like actually i think that was more on you than the doctor okay if okay. i'm being honest she was in a time crunch as uh -huh. all er doctors are uh -huh. you had what a broken arm yes you're I not did. bleeding you're not even priority uh -huh. to her and you won't tell her where it hurts so she was doing that to diagnose where where specifically it was broken ouch literally <laughs> So I think that was more on you. But in terms of bedside manners, I think shadowing a doctor would be great because okay. you get to actually interact with patients and talk to them more and understand how they feel. And mm -hmm. like the nervousness and this kind of like fear they have mm -hmm. for the doctors, yeah. which is, you know, which is reasonable because mm -hmm. they are sick. Yeah. Right. Um, and also like... Obviously, with all these activities that, that doctors, I mean, not doctors, but like, you know, people aspiring to become doctors, pre-medical students have to juggle. Um, how do you uh, find yourself able to balance this stuff or how, like, how do other people that you know who are pursuing medicine manage their time? Uh, aside from downloading UniPlan, of course, the amazing app, which will be available very soon. Um, so I have this friend at UCI. He is also a chem major. Okay. And if he listens to this, I hope he has a good day. Uh, he works part time, right? Okay. He does yep. like 20 hours of research. And somehow, somehow he still manages to pull a 4.0 this quarter. If you want time management skills, you go talk to him. <laughs> he, Interesting. He is very bright. He's a very bright individual. There's no... There's no questioning that. Okay. But he's also very hardworking. He gets he studies every every chance he gets. Okay. He would he taught this method to me. It's called the cubicle method. So we have um, the science library at UCI where they literally have a desk with walls around it. It's a cubicle. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. We have those too. Yeah, yeah, you stay there. You stay there for six hours and you read through the book. Don't pause. <laughs> okay, maybe pause take a break once in a while. Ouch, but like. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. Okay, see, there. to me, that sounds really depressing. I did that in um, my first semester of college, and I didn't really like it. Um, I ended up working in more group environments, you know, like, or just staying in my room, which is not as depressing, you know, putting some light music on, whatever. How do you maintain your sanity and your mental health while being in such an uncomfortable position that you know is good for you and you know gets you focused, but 
is really just kind of depressing per se. First off, I just want to say, what a nerd. Okay. Ouch. <laughs> okay. And second, um, how do I stay sane in that environment? <laughs> I think I've showed you this, but I have. Okay, so I was studying for my final for mm -hmm. um, for ecology. Okay. Um, I was I made a study guide, and on the bottom of it, it said, "I will go to Harvard Med School." Every time I work on it, I get to see that little phrase, and that motivates me. Harvard Med School. <laughs> why, why Harvard particularly? What's so interesting about Harvard? I was just, it was the first school that came to my mind <laughs> at that time. Not Johns Hopkins, wink wink. No, I'd rather not live in Baltimore, oh, thanks. My <laughs> okay, so, quick aside, I guess. Um, so Julie and I were, I were supposed to talk about this, um, but... I, since you're here and you're a pre-medical student, obviously, it'd be nice to talk about it right now. What, what's your opinion on the whole um, coronavirus pandemic? And do you think that people are overreacting or do you think it's, you know, perfectly reasonable? Because a lot, obviously a lot of universities have been shut down, which impacts us. Um, and now people are working from home. There's a lot of, you know, memes about it, whatever. Like we have to go to Zoom University now. <laughs> but... Um, what, what is your opinion on, on the way universities have responded to that? And are they, uh, like, are they reacting appropriately or do you think it's just way too far? I think they're perfectly reasonable okay. in their approach. Because what you want to do is you want to distance yourself, <laughs> social distancing, six feet away, you know? And how that helps is that it slows the, uh, the rate of infections, you know? Okay. So... I don't know. I don't think you will put graphics because I don't think it's possible. But you've seen the two curves, right? One with very steep curve and the other like more a flatter curve. Yeah, flattening the curve. Yeah. Yeah, and that's supposed to help um, uh, slow the rate of infection, which helps uh, the availability for ICU beds. So if you if there are less people being infected at a time there'll be less there'll be more room for people to get appropriate care at the icu if that makes sense yeah that does make sense mm -hmm. so i mean yeah i mean obviously like i think social distancing is a, is a good idea right. um and i guess the appropriate response to that is putting a lot of universities on lockdown but how do you think this will impact student learning right like i know for me personally i mentioned uh, previously that I'm an engineering student, and so lectures are quite important to me. Lab mm -hmm. lectures, projects, stuff like that, more hands-on activities. How do you think it affects you and the rest of the pre-medical community? Well, it affects me quite a lot. I'm a chem major, and as I've stated before, uh, I have I do wet labs, right, as my a part of my curriculars. Sure, yeah. Curriculums, curriculum. I said curricular. Sorry. Um, anyway, so now apparently what they're going to do is like is they're going to have a TA. And they're going mm -hmm. to film the TA doing the lab so we can watch the TA and record data and observations from that video, which I think is pretty funny. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. right? And then we're going to write a report on that, apparently. I think that's not a great way for people to learn lab skills, obviously, because right, right, they're right. not doing the lab. And lab skills are only acquired if you actually step into the lab and do stuff, you know? Sure, yeah. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, so I think it's been pretty detrimental for me as a chem major and uh, people at UCI. So apparently bio majors, this is their first quarter or spring quarter, next quarter is their first quarter they'll ever step into a lab, uh, a teaching lab. And they're, they're robbed of that because of this corona social distancing thing, mm -hmm. you know, because they won't even get the appropriate lab skills they need to do research, which I think is very unfortunate. Interesting. Uh, so obviously we're not we're not experts on the coronavirus. We're not right. experts on COVID nineteen um, or anything. But I mean, I, I do I do want to ask you. Um, you now, aside from the university setting, do you think people are overreacting in just the public square? Like, for example, stocking up on toilet paper, which is really funny. Like I've seen people fight over it. Um, just a side note, it's COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID sorry, sorry, yep. Um, and I mean, it's kind of funny watching these people run around and stocking stacks of stacks of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think, honestly, it's a little unreasonable because, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah certainly. Yeah, because, you know, toilet paper, 
it's not that big of a concern for me right yeah. now. But food, I feel like it's a little more reasonable. Sure, yeah. Because they need to feed their children who are off of school right now, you know, because mm-hmm. of the school closing thing. And they need some way to feed those children. It's food. Yeah. I mean, I totally understand, like, you know, hand sanitizer, yeah. soap, food. Oh, can we talk about masks? That's what oh. makes me the maddest. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead. So yeah. if you didn't know, masks, if you're not sick... It's useless. They're useless, you know, because mm. the way they're woven, especially surgical masks, the little grids are very big compared to the virus. So the virus can just pass through very freely. What it helps is that if you're sick and you're symptomatic, if you're coughing, if you're sneezing, those are aerosols. So the part, your liquid particles on the aerosols, will, um, the virus will stick to that and then it'll get caught in the grid because they're significantly bigger than the virus. And that's supposed to help. Yeah, so I know Dr. Mike talked about this, and I watched his videos, and uh, I know he talks a lot about how the masks really don't help unless they're N95. But after doing a little research, I actually searched up N95 masks, and um, according to the FDA, even N95 masks aren't effective. I don't think you did that research. I think I did. Um, I searched it up last night on the uh, FDA. Well, I looked up the nanometers. Oh, uh, okay, okay, size okay, okay whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, tomato, tomato. Oh, uh, no. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> The FDA says, and uh, I quote, like, N95 masks are not an effective um, way to protect against the coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's it's really important to wash your hands. I think that's more important than anything because that's really what um, stops you from... From, especially like after, if you don't wash your hands and you touch your your face, that's really how COVID nineteen gets into your system. Yeah. So it's really important to not touch you know surfaces. It's important to always wash your hands after you do touch a surface and if after you meet with someone or something like that. Um, it's really interesting how COVID nineteen works. Actually, I believe it's like I said, I'm not a medical expert, but I believe it sticks around in the air, and if you touch that and or you breathe into it and you touch your face that's how it it gets into your system and i don't know if that's 100 percent accurate but that's what i've read um from the cdc and the world health organization so right yeah so um i don't know if you've heard this but you know apparently obviously italy is a covid 19 in italy a big big problem yeah of and course. now they're prioritizing healthcare. yeah which is a very, very un- unethical thing to do. Sure, yeah. Obviously, because you're choosing who lives and who dies. You're essentially playing God, mm-hmm. right? You're yeah. choosing younger people over older people. It, this is like this is actually the trolley car problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It is such an unfortunate thing that this happens to Italy yeah. and it's happening right now to people who are you know, not getting the appropriate care they need because they're a little older. Yep. Yeah, well, no, I know. I have a I have a friend who's from Italy. He's um he's in the electrical engineering department with me at Johns Hopkins and I don't think he can go home. A lot of people who are from Europe can't even go home now because the epidemic is so bad. Right. I know President Trump the other day um ordered a total ban on travel to I, I think it's from Europe, um for sure. I'm not sure if it's to Europe as well, but my friends said they were having a really hard time booking flights at all. Um, so, I mean, and, and especially, you know, countries like China, South Korea right now are also having huge problems. So, you know, it's just, it's sad. It's a little devastating to see, like, people not be able to return to their homes because of um, this coronavirus. And I guess even in the States, like, it, we, we kind of, um, we kind of have, like, a huge like we said, pandemic, right? We, we panic a lot about it. And so it's a huge issue for us. Um, but there's a lot of medical research going on. My school is doing a lot of medical research. I think there was some mi- two microbiologists that are working on um, an in-house like testing kit so we can get more people tested for coronavirus, which is super, super important right. in the grand scheme of things because if we can't catch the people who have it, we can't you know, prevent Actually, it. Actually, I... Th- I feel like this is one of the reasons why uh, social distancing, it is such a reasonable choice of action. We don't really know who has coronavirus and who doesn't Mm -hmm. because testing right now is so inadequate. It is so scanty that we don't even know, we can't differentiate individuals who need to be quarantined. 
That's why people are self-quarantining themselves and their family, which is a really smart thing to do. Yeah. Right. All right. So obviously that was an interesting discussion about coronavirus, but getting back, I guess, into the you know med school part of things, the whole medicine aspect. Um, you mentioned that you want to be a cardiologist, right? Mm-hmm. Is there any particular reason why you chose cardiology specifically out of you know all the all the fields you could have chosen, and and what really draws you to it? Right. So um, what if I'm really deciding between cardio and cardio surgeon actually? Okay. Because. Interesting. Um, Cardi cardio problems are the leading cause of death in America right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, yeah, heart disease. Yeah, yeah. heart disease. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why I really want to go into cardio. I could help a lot more people uh, get better and get well, especially cardio surgery. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know I don't really want to be a family doctor, as bad as it sounds, because I feel like family doctors they sit around too much, and that's not the lifestyle I want to lead. Okay. I yeah, want sure. to be more like active in my job. And I want to like you know walk around, talk to people, talk to nurses, talk to patients. Well, if they're responsive, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, yeah. And that's just the lifestyle I want to I want to lead. Yeah, and that's partly why I became a uh, chemist because of the labs. Fun after yeah. a while. Yeah, no, that's interesting, definitely. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess final question before we end the podcast here. Um, we talked a lot about what it takes to get into medical school and to become a doctor, but what does it take to become a pre-medical student, right? Like, I'm sure there are a lot of high school students out here, like, that are really interested in pursuing a pre-medical path. Um, what should they do in high school to prepare themselves for this sort of path? And and um, what do you think will look, like, really impressive to colleges when they're, you know, applying to them as a pre-medical student? Uh, first, ask yourself, why do you even want to become a doctor? Because... I got this advice a lot when I was in high school figuring out what I want to be in the future. I, For the longest time, I had the worst reason to become a doctor, which was for the money. That's the po- worst possible reason you could have. Because, first of all, they do make a lot of money, yes, but they do also have a lot of debt. So it kind of cancels it out, you know? So if, you want, if you're looking for stability, go into engineering, go into CS. A lot more stable, less debt. And... Secondly, if you're going to do a job you hate for the rest of your life, that doesn't sound pleasant to me, you know, mm, just for yeah. the money. Yeah, quick interruption, by the way. Um, I encourage you not to go into CS or engineering if you're also not interested in those fields. I'm going to be totally honest here. If you're just in it for the money, um, there's not really a field I would suggest for you in college to be totally honest. Like maybe this is a push, but like business, because I think business inherently just deals with money or like finance or economics or something. But even then, I think you have to have some, you know, like semblance of interest in it. I want to say passion super important, guys, like, or like at least some sort of interest. I, I don't think you can make it in any field without right. genuinely being interested in it. I know like engineering is really stable and everything, but a lot of people I know dropped out, right? Like I think a third of our engineering class dropped out after the first, um, the first midterm because they thought it was just way too hard. So they just switched majors. They switched to computer science, ironically enough, which I know Julian mentions is also a field that you need to be passionate about. So um, I don't think you can, I honestly don't think you can pursue like a career and actually enjoy it and not have a passion for it. Would you, would you agree with that? I mean, you could look, for me, it's about determination. Yeah. If you could just, if you could just stomach it for four years. <laughs> okay yeah yeah i'm sure but yeah back to your point um so what was i, what was I saying yeah we, so we were talking about you said um um don't go into medicine right. if you're you know if you're not interest genuinely interested mm-hmm. in it if you don't have a passion for it and yeah. then we we're like i was asking you about um advice that you have for students who are looking to go into a pre-medical path okay so high school students yeah high school, for, okay. so are high school students yeah um don't be a bio major <laughs> i think that would be oh okay Cause, that's controversial well see. well because you have so many other people all in bio ma- my majors are literally they only have healthcare as a path in life you know you don't really uh you're not really unique if you're a bio major but if you're a chem major which is a little harder but you can stomach chem then you could you stand out to the um ad comms which is administration admission committee you know uh-huh, yeah. you took the harder route and um even if you don't choose a STEM 
a STEM major, it's okay. You know, you could be an art major and still make it. I knew, um, I've heard stories of uh, theology majors now being successful uh, dermatologists. That's crazy. Yeah, just do what you're passionate about in college, I would say, and be and be good at it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's some solid advice. So, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. Um, thank you for listening to the Study Space podcast. We know that there are countless other podcasts being published every day, and you've decided to listen to ours in particular. It really means a lot to us that you've given your time to listen to us. The show notes with links and everything we mentioned in this episode for further reading and learning are on our website at uniplan.dev. If you want to show support, share the podcast or tell a friend about it. Your testimonial to your friends and family is the most helpful thing you can do for us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. That's it for this one. We'll see you next time on the Study Space Podcast.